Hello, everyone. How you doing? Thank you. Um, my name is uh, Mary Randall, and this is uh, Chris Tanaro. And uh, we're here to talk to you about a project that we've been working on. Um, in, it's, a, it's a visual arts project that's going to be shown in a gallery next year. So we have a uh, teaser here to show you, and then we'll explain everything around it after that. Um, yeah, and so, I mean, um, this project started, um, yep, here we go. It started quite a while ago, um, and it was these, these um, driftwood structures, or these creatures, these things, these beings, on this beach on an island. We did a number of uh, residencies. And uh, so we isolated this photography to get these sort of lone sentinel sort of creatures out of these driftwood beach. It was a very sort of isolated beach, and it was um, quite desolate and lonely. Um, and so initially, we sort of tried to make these creatures that lived there. Um, we made them out of photographs of the driftwood. We did 3D scanning. Uh, I presented here about four years ago to try and get this project happening, but it never quite worked. We couldn't quite work out um, what to do with them because they became anthropomorphic very quickly. They were characters doing the Pixar sort of type movements, whereas they were trying to be more visual arts, maybe, and more uh, ethereal sort of beings. And it just didn't become serious. It looked really silly, <laughs> I think. And, and so, therefore, you know, we left it go for a while, and then we just picked it up recently. And so, uh, I'll put it on to Mary um, for the, the why. So, yeah, I came onto this project, and I have a, a background in film and TV and advertising, but ultimately I'm a visual artist. And so I always draw on visual language to be able to communicate with my audiences. So um, I guess the brief was when we sort of like decided to work on this project. Um, we, I've got the one-line synopsis here, which is a short film about a mesmerised crab adrift in the void. Okay, so that's what you've just seen. Um, and so if we look at, break that down, there's a couple of interesting words there. So uh, what we were planning to make was an immersive, mesmerising and potentially disorientating experience for the audience. So that's uh, it's like a, a different kind of experience that we're trying to create as, uh, for, so that you can experience the same thing that the protagonist or this crab is experiencing. So the definition for mesmerised, as you can see here, is to capture someone's attention, to basically hypnotise them um, so that you can you know, get them to do what you want them to do. And we're using the typical tools that we'd use you know, to, 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 to communicate with an audience. So that's the visual design, the shot composition and movement, uh, motion design and sequencing. 
So we talk about, you know, the, 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 the what and, and, you know, the how, and, and now I suppose it's, it's the why. What was the theme behind this? And we sort of playfully call this uh, crabby noir uh, for a, a while there because of the, the way it was starting to look. So I often talk about this in, in and I use a, a more elaborate uh, way of describing it as being the seductive dance of compulsive desires. And what I'm talking about there is this idea of addictions because they sort of keep you locked in the Sisyphean cycle, this loop that you can't break free of. And there will always be these, these temptations. So if you're trying to give up smoking, for instance, there will always be this little thing inside you, this little voice that's saying, you know, it would be so much better if you just had another puff or do this or whatever. So, you know, that in a sense is what we've tried to create with this experience um, and this shadow a uh, creature, this, this shadow crab in, in this particular story, is all about trying to distract you, or I refer to it as the exquisite distraction, because it is such a dance, you know, this tango that we have with ourselves in order to try and, and break free of this sort of Sisyphean cycle so that we can evolve and go further. So... Um, when we're talking about sort of an altered state of mind or trying to, you know, sort of communicate that experience, we drew on one of the earlier sort of um, uh, examples of this, the cabinet of Dr Caligari, where they were trying to portray the, in, in the, the perspective of, of what it was like to be a schizophrenic. And so they take, they'd gotten a visual reference from schizophrenic patients and then they created this distorted world. And, um, and so we've sort of drawn on that in a, in a range of different ways. And, I, and we've also drawn on, on um, and these exoskeleton creatures, these crabs and, and these peacock spiders. And the reason that we chose them specifically is because they do this, this thing called signalling, these displays, where, so that they can lure mates. In fact, when we were having lunch, we were watching a pigeon try and do the same thing. And uh, it's really interesting to sort of see the different ways that they try and lure these uh, creatures. And, and so that's what you saw in that teaser. We picked that particular sequence, because there's always a scene in, 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 a, in a film uh, where it defines the, 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 the theme of what you're trying to create. And that's what we picked out. We picked out the most important scene and, and we tried to e explain what this idea of desire was about. There are other things that we drew on as well. As I said, I've got a background in film and TV, and so uh, this idea of the one-point perspective, which is the signature shot of, um, of, of Stanley Kubrick, he's done it in all of his films, and he uses it whenever he is trying to uh, sort of communicate this altered state of, of, of this altered perspective. Um, and the interesting thing about the research that we ended up doing when we were looking at these creatures um, was that uh, scientists are pretty obsessed with the one-point perspective as well. And uh, when uh, Chris talks later about the peacock spider, you'll see why. Uh, we also want, we, as, you, as, we, as we've been talking about, we're always trying to create this distorted perspective to try and, you know, communicate that experience. And so this really interesting circular camera shot from uh, The Haunting of Hill House was another sort of example where you can, you've got an over the shoulder here and we've sort of like gone for a, a POV shot with the way we've communicated this. But, the, um, but again, it shows this uh, larger uh, understanding of the environment that this crab exists in. Jordan Peele is also another really exciting uh, director that plays around with distorted perspective, again, to alter the view, this experience that we're trying to, to really pers uh, uh, pursue. So this is the imp impossible focus shot. He used this in both Us and, and, and Get Out, where he's composited two uh, uh, um, shots in post um, because obviously the, the extreme close-up is, is a very shallow depth of field and then he's uh, uh, combined that with a long shot. So that everything's in, in focus all at once, which is you know, an, an interesting way of trying to communicate these ideas. And over to Chris for the rest. Um, yeah, so if Mary was the why and the what, I'm the how. How do we do this thing? How do we conjure this crab? Conjuring the inner crab, I guess. Um, and so we talked a lot about whether the, it was the mind of the crab in the soul of the spider, maybe, or the, the mind of the spider in the, in the body of the crab, or what are we trying to, who's conjuring who and what are they doing? But in, in essence, it's like a, a transposed motion, motion from one source to go to the next source. And um, as you'll see in a second with this, these, these movies, um, it's loops within loops within loops. Um, we're talking about the addiction cycle and being stuck and trapped in these little things like the, the, the Sisyphus uh, pushing the boulder up the hill. And so I'll play these things. I don't know if you know what peacock spiders are, but they're, um, they're beautiful, tiny, tiny little spiders. They're Australian, and they're becoming an internet sensation, I think, maybe just in Australia, I suppose, I'm not sure. But everyone sort of talks about them because they have these unique dances. And it's the male is the colourful uh, version, the, 
females are quite bland in, in these uh, peacock spiders. And they all have distinctive, unique dances. Um, we, and they're trying to hypnotize, to mesmerize, to lure. And uh, they're discovering new species all the time. I think this was the, yeah, the sparkle muffin one. And he does his own little dance. And everyone's got their unique little crazy loopy thing. They're just beautiful. And they remind me of, of little puppies, perhaps. I'm not really sure. But there's something about them that drew us to say, well, we want the crab to move like that, not like a crab crab. This is my, one of my favorites, I think. It's just so simple. Um, and then when he does the side to side, yeah, there we go. <laughs> and, and for me, that's a mesmerizing motion. It's just a simple little loop, and you're just drawn to it because it's repetitive, repetitive, repetitive. Um, and I'll just play the rest of these guys. But, and there's one coming up in a second, which I think is my favorite. It's the simplest one of all. <laughs> this is the guy, yeah. He's, uh, and it's nutty. It's really, really funny. And so, you know, we were thinking that that's the motion we want to do because it's, it's, it's a not a complicated motion, it's, it's not simple, but it's not complicated, and we can construct it quite, quite easily. And then after their dance, they do the final consummation. Uh, ideally, the prey or the female has been mesmerized and hypnotized, and they're in a trance-like state, and that's when they move in. So I think that's the end of that. And so that's the size of the spiders. You know? so they're really, really, really small little things, like five millimeters, I think, to maybe to one centimeter. And that's why this incredibly shallow depth of field. But Anyway, and so that's the spiders, and so the crab, um, I didn't know this, but crabs do lick and clean their eyeballs with their mouths, that's where I got that first animation from. And they move in a certain way, and so you can see that he does a slow motion to the side, he'll stop for quite a while, and then do a, a really, really fast moment, uh, movement when he's um, out of the way. I think I'll show that, I think that loops around. Um, and so that's what my sort of goal was to try to do, to try and combine these two forms, um, these two motions, or these two sort of styles together. Um, and yeah, and so initially, and so it was a gallery uh, project. It was a, an art, a visual arts project in a gallery space. We were going to do multiple sort of interactive um, displays of these mesmerizing motions. Uh, and, and that was going, we were going to use Unreal. We started to use Unreal quite heavily um, because it was a VR interaction. Uh, we were doing PBR materials from Substance Painter. We were doing lots of, lots of animation loops, and, and uh, Unreal has a very nice sequencer. Um, so you can layer these things with, with additive motion. Um, and we are possibly doing a swarm of crabs as well. And so Unreal was the perfect choice. But um, we, and e uh, Blender 2.8 wasn't out yet. So we were doing some tests in Eevee. And then I would go and sort of reconstruct the whole thing in Unreal. And, uh, and then Mary would always say, oh, can we just have the one from Blender? Because it looks cleaner and crisper and simpler. And I'd get really upset because I'd spent all this time recreating it and, and layering these animations. But once 2.8 came out and we sort of looked at Eevee, it was just really simple. I was, I was really having a, a tough time of getting the same look in Unreal. We just dumped it and we went back to Blender because um, we were sort of recreating the, the, um, the thing I've already made. So it was a bit of a waste of time, but it was nice to sort of get a, 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 a structure. Um, and, yeah, and so this is the, the sort of system I, I developed. So we have a, um, I don't know if you use the NLA editor, but we have one small loop with seven, seven frames of just one step of the crab. Uh, and so that just does one movement. And, and typically you would push, uh, uh, repeat, repeat that little clip over and over, but in this case it had just looped back to the, the start. So I, I thought that was quite limited, but then I, I researched it quite a, a bit more, and um, we just have one little clip of seven frames, then we extend the end of that, so it sort of lasts forever, and then he can keep walking. That's great. So very, you know, and, and grab, crabs are quite robotic creatures, so we could get away with a lot doing this. We wanted the simplest sort of method. So that was good, but then um, these other things you can do with actions is that down the, right down the bottom there's an animated strip time. I never knew what that meant or what it was, but essentially we can control that, that animation with a curve, with an animation curve, which we'll see in a second. So there we go. And so you can slow down the walk, you can go backwards, forwards, you can make it really fast, really, really slow, just by this control curve. And that was the answer. And so with the crabs, they come to a gradual rest, which is called a moving hold. It almost comes to a stop, and then it does a really fast motion out. So you can see here that I'm just um, trying to get a bit of a moving hold, coming to a rest with, with just a, a slight touch of motion to, um, to get that, that movement, that crazy crab movement. And if the, the cycle, the original cycle, is, is strong enough and, it's, and it doesn't slide at all, then there isn't much slipping of the feet at, at all, even as, as much as you can speed it up and slow it down. 
So the moment there's just a, a, a complete stop, but here is the moving hold. Just make a slight little um, adjustment and you'll come to a gradual, gradual. So it was just sensational, really, really, really easy. Uh, solution, which, and I don't know how I came up with it or, or what, I, what I saw online to do it with, but it, it was a, a really nice solution. And so I then used that as well for the thorax. We didn't get too far with the thorax peacock spider thing. Um, and so I did one loop of the thorax, just doing that. And I think that's well, like, like four frames, I think it was. Um, and then I used a curve to say, well, I want to speed it up or slow it down and then do a really a fast wiggle. And that's what the curve looks like for that. So these small little rest spots and then sync that up with the music. So yeah, complicated I suppose, but simple I suppose. I'm not really sure which one it is, but really beautiful, really, really hidden little feature that, that made it really nice. And so then I added another um, a noise action on top of that. I could draw it in or draw it out or, or speed it up or slow it down and start syncing these up. Um, yeah, really, really nice stuff. And so um, that was the sort of system that I developed. And then, this is the real-time aspect of it. We sort of, because um, Mary wanted to be included in the cinematography. Now, I was happy to do the rigging and the, the, the grunt work. And so we had one scene, um, and basically we started at zero and went to 3,000 or something. Um, and we had the crabs doing that walk cycle and I attached them to a curve. So they walked along the ground, up along the stick. The other crab walked along the stick as well. And so um, we got to the point where it was a live scene um, we didn't sort of, we didn't storyboard at all, we just sort of made the live scene so then Mary could come along and play with the cameras while it's like doing a live vision switching, I, I suppose. Mm. Um, and, and, and actually I did storyboard quite a bit, just, just quite <laughs> Which I ignored, I think. Because yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. we're sort of last minute people, we, that's just how we work, unfortunately that's how I always work and we wanted to be able to have as much creativity at the end that you do at the beginning. And in a uh, traditional animation cycle, or production, production cycle, there's no spontaneity at the end. It, it doesn't exist. You've done your storyboarding, pre-production, production, you're in post. You can't go back and change the character or change these things. You, you can't do that. Whereas we wanted to use a real-time strategy to be able to have this um, creativity. And yeah, and, and this trailer, uh, we didn't quite finish it. We didn't quite get there, but that's the scene. It's a live scene. Um, and, and here is the, the crab rig, um, which I <laughs> really struggled with. I really had a great difficulty with it, but it worked. It, it, was, it was good in the end. We, um, so he is stuck, or oh, sorry, like a path constraint. He, he moves with his little walk cycle along a path, which is a, sitting above the, the stick, um, and animated it with the, with the curve, so he just comes to these little moving holes, these little rest spots. Um, and then I had... I think the base level of the crab, and that's the sort of moving along the actual stick itself. So he's attached to a curve, but he can sort of move and, he, and sort of he's stuck there with, a, with shrink wrap constraints on each foot. Um, then I've got the body on top of that, when, he, when the legs are stuck to the stick. And then the feet, I, I sort of spent a while thinking, well, I wanted to have the, the feet being able to move, but then the parent of that is the, the shrink wrap. So those things are stuck to the stick, but the, the, the feet can then have an extra layer of motion on top of that. Um, so yeah, multiple sort of levels just to give us the, the flexibility we want. But it's all about, well, and the next version of this project is the, the intricacies of getting this motion, this peacock spider motion, which we couldn't quite get to. We just got the scene working, got him walking, and that was cool. Um, yeah, and that's him. And yeah, once again, and so the, um, we didn't, we had uh, the, the shadow crab was living in a big pile of driftwood on the beach. Um, and I, I think this, this sort of teaser has been a process in reduction. We, we had all these ambitions and it just got smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. In the end, it's just a stick. It's just one stick in blackness. Because we couldn't, uh, the shadows and Evie, I, I had a great, uh, quite a lot of struggle with. With so many different sticks and, and things around, I just couldn't control the shadows in time. So we sort of got rid of that. But um, actually, I'll go to the next. And so, <laughs> on to Mary, I guess. 
Well, I mean, this is for both of us, really, because um, a part of the, the journey that we're taking with this is that, you know, we've, we've done the teaser, it's a really great proof of concept, but the next phase is working out what the, the, the next, the, end, the ending's going to be. So I don't know if anybody watches the, uh, the World Blender meetup days, but um, uh, during this, the one last year, uh, Chris uh, demonstrated this thing called the eyeball tunnel, which is something that I'm just fascinated with, and it's the, it's the shot in the middle. So that's where we sort of started with, and I, it's a very exciting sort of aspect of, of this, this crab's journey, I suppose. And so we're drawing on a couple of different references for this, uh, which is uh, Andy Goldsworthy, um, who's an environmental artist, and MC Escher, who I assume is a national of yours. And, uh, but we're actually going to go to Spain next week uh, with uh, one of our original collaborators who lives in uh, London. Hi, Robin. Uh, and we're going to, um, yeah, work out what that, that next phase is going to all be about. And uh, that's, that's a really exciting So, yeah, aspect. so I, I, I did uh, the Blender meetups for a few years in Brisbane, and I kept showing eyeballs and sticks, and I, I didn't know where it was going. We were sort of doing this practice-led thing, and, and it'll emerge from what we're doing. But no one really, um, really knew what I was talking about. They thought I was a bit deranged, I think, because it just didn't make sense. And I was showing the eyeball tunnel, and I animated it, with, and they all looked at like a creature that was going through this tunnel, and it didn't work. But it's finally coming, coming true. And it's something that we couldn't have planned two years ago or a year ago to get to the end. We just couldn't really do that, I, I don't think. And so it's emerging in the opposite way that it's supposed to, I suppose. Um, and so we're really trying to visualise... So essentially, the shadow crab lives on a pile of driftwood sticks with eyeballs. It's like an eyeball, eyeball kingdom, I suppose it is. And uh, lures the other crab into that, and then that, the, the normal crab um, goes into the void, the eyeball tunnel void thing, <laughs> whatever that is. Um, and yeah, and so, yeah, so one, one more, one last slide, I've got to say. Um, so I, I teach Maya, I teach Maya uh, back in Brisbane, Australia. And um, we actually went to Blender for a while, and then back to Maya again. And so in this, I've been teaching Maya while going to Blender uh, and, and doing this project, and I just lost my mind. Because I, I, when you teach 3D software, you have to use default hotkeys. You, you can't do any custom hotkeys. It has to be you know, factory presets. Um, and so when Blender 2.8 came out with the industry-compatible uh, keys, that was great. But one, the, the one thing I really liked about Maya, and I still like about it, is the marking menus. I don't know if there's Maya users here who, who use them, but the, the shift... Um, right-click and the right-click marking menus are really, really fast. And so I, I spent quite a while to make Blender work like Maya, but to make the Blender Pi menus exactly like Maya. So um, I, I yeah, made my own custom ones using the Pi menu editor. It's a plugin. I think it's $10. I'm not sure what it was. Uh, excellent plugin. Fantastic. So I could just move back and forward between them, same hotkeys, same marking menus, same everything. And that, for me, that made quite a lot of difference. Uh, I'll, I'll share a video of that online on my, my website. Um, as a Maya, you know, Maya Blender person, I don't know what that is. Um, that was really helpful. It was amazing. Um, so I guess uh, just one last shout out to our global audience, which is uh, uh, Chelsea and uh, and Michael. Help, uh, thank you for helping and, and uh, supporting us through this uh, journey. And I suppose Bill and Steve as well, who've um, we, we had a number of uh, sponsors throughout this process, and and uh, that's been really really helpful. Otherwise, we probably wouldn't have done it. That's true. Yeah. All right. Um, so thank you for listening. Thank you. Thanks.